basic rules of correct bowling. The arm alone makes the ball move, the wrist and fingers being supple and flexible. The height of the elbow at the middle of the ball is such that it is parallel with the screw. In the history of teaching techniques, this difficult question has been answered in a variety of ways. For instance, in the old German school, the correct position of the elbow was as close as possible to the body of the player. To test the student's capacity to do so, she or he was asked to keep a book under the arm. If the student failed in the book fell, she or he was not considered apt to master any basic technique of the instrument. Today we consider this premise absurd and wrong. For us, nothing is more important in understanding the basic of the production of a good sound than acquiring total freedom of movement. Our physical constitution is composed of many circular forms and their movements, head, arms, legs, whole body, etc. Now before all, you always make sure that every move of the bow be parallel with the bridge. Then it becomes helpful to remember that in normal use the arm rotates around two axes, made possible by the humerus bone shoulder to elbow and the ulna forearm. So when you conduct the bow and want to prevent the right hand from turning around the axis, you have to think of correcting its trajectory. Let's analyze what happens with the hand moving in a straight line. We distinguish three steps. At outset, moving the fork to the tip, the shoulder will retreat a little. Then close to the middle of the bow, the shoulder pauses and the forearm continues to move until it becomes necessary to prevent a circular movement around the axis. At that moment, we open the arms, a bit pushing the shoulder forward. When we move the tip of the bow back toward the frog, the steps are performed in the opposite order. The shoulder goes backward, pauses at a certain point, the bow moves thanks to the forearm, and finally the shoulder goes forward to allow it to join the frog again. The bow stick must be slightly turned toward the fingerboard and generally forms a 45 degrees angle with the strings. We must explain to the students that this is just as all other parts of our practice of the violin, nothing but the laws of physics. The tension of the strings augments in uh, the direction of the bridge. The player of a string instrument, not only the violin but others too, must rotate the stick in order to adjust the pressure on the string and use the stick to direct this pressure lightly to the bridge. The right hand thumb must always stay round despite the fact that it will be straightened out a little. When it moves toward the end of the bow, but the capturing should never be strongly distorted. In this way, the roundness of the fingers can be maintained with perfect control of the bow. What happens to the little finger at the end but of the bow? The answer to this question depends on the structure of the hands of different violinists. In special cases, if the pinky is long enough, it may rest on the stick, but there is certainly no need to. We observe that when the arm moves without constraints. The wrist moves also horizontally around the axis, which is none other than capture ring. It is completely natural that the wrist, while keeping good hold of the ball, turns slightly over the ball stick in one direction 
or the other. This is necessary to avoid all kinds of tension in the fingers as well as to prevent the involvement of the wrist in the movement of the hand and the dropping of it at the tip. If the fingers squeeze the stick and are like glued on it, the wrist goes naturally down to the end of the ball. To avoid that, it is by far preferable to have the little finger lose contact with the stick. If this finger is long enough and stays on the stick when one plays it at the tip, without prompting the dropping of the wrist, it is very well. If the wrist lets go of the stick at the end of the ball, so as not to have a setback, there is no problem either. No extreme movement, pause or gesture must ever be ours when we play the violin. We have to stay away from them. In this sense, the right hand of the violinist should never be extremely tight or open when playing. Therefore, to preserve flexibility in maneuvering the ball, to preserve mobility during ball changes, we need to allow a certain margin of space to the apparatus of control. If the right hand has freedom of action thanks to a supple wrist and it moves around its axis as it needs to, it will enable us to find a free conduct of the ball and so to free the full sonority of the instrument. The hollow of the wrist at the end, at the end of the ball should not exceed the slight bend that happens when the hand is posed tranquilly on any plane surface. As I have indicated earlier, when you play, any position with no exit is always forbidden. Don't ever let them happen. The movements of the violinist must always have a margin of breeze, always be round and elegant. 